Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So good to see each and every one of you. We appreciate you being here today. If you are a guest with us, we just want to say thank you and thank you so much for joining us today. In our bulletin, you'll see we have our connection card. It looks just like this. If you would please fill that out for us, write your information on there. We'd love to follow up with you, get to know you, to pray for you. And you can put this in either one of the offering plates um, at the end of the service. Church family, also, if you have any prayer needs, if there's any way we can be praying for you, um, any praises maybe you have to share with your church family, go ahead and fill that out on this connection card as well. We meet every Tuesday as a staff. We'd love to pray for you. There's a spot at the bottom, too, that says, do we have your email address? If we don't have your email, we'd like to get that from you so we can keep you updated on how you can be praying for your church family. So go ahead and fill that out for us, okay? A few other updates of, of what's happening this week. First off, tomorrow, Monday, we have uh, an opportunity for us to meet at the schools, the elementary school, the middle school, the high school, and the administrative building. At 8 a.m., there's going to be a time where we, you can choose to go to one of those four locations and you can pray um, just for the school year. Some of the teachers might be there, and I encourage you to get involved in that. Again, 8 o'clock to pray at any one of those schools, okay? We also have our grocery ministry tomorrow, and that starts at 9 a.m. over at the Family Life Center. And we could use as much help as we could get, so if you'd like to get involved, if you're available, um, please let me know. We'd, we'd love for you to come and get involved as we help those families in this community and to show God's love to them. On Wednesday, we have our weekday service. That's our live stream devotional at 1 o'clock. And we have our youth and children over at the Family Life Center from 5.30 to 7. So make sure to come on for that as well. Also, we just need to be continuing to pray for our brother George and sister Frankie. And we need to continue to be praying for Leo and for Linda as well. And just especially as our schools are starting this Wednesday the 26th, we need to be praying for our schools as well. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for another day that you have given us, Lord. May we rejoice in it. Lord, we thank you for just the wonderful opportunity we have this morning to, to come into your house, Lord, to worship you in praise and song and through the studying of your word. Lord, we do lift up, I know there's many brothers and sisters this morning who are, who are struggling with their health, with other struggles, Lord, even besides. And we just, Lord, pray for them. Lord, we ask for healing to come. By your hand, we specifically lift up our brother George to you. Lord, please, Father, we pray for your healing um, upon him, for your strength upon him. We pray that you be with Frankie as well, that you just overwhelm her with your peace and love. Lord, we thank you for, for our brother Leo and continue to pray for healing over him, Father, and for Linda, just for your peace and love to overwhelm her as well, Father. We thank you for just the schools, Lord, all the teachers, all the staff. We know there's many staff at, at these campuses behind the scenes, Lord, that are working so hard. We just pray for them, for uh, Dr. Kaufman, for many, Lord, um, involved in our schools, for the students. Lord, we just ask for your protection over all of them, Lord, that you give them wisdom, that you give them guidance as they start up. We pray for, that you would just bless this school year, Father. Lord, we again just thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word, Father, to praise you in song and praise. And Lord, I pray you be with uh, Brother Greg this morning as he brings your word to us. We know you put this message on his heart. And we pray that we open our ears, that we hear what we need to hear, that we apply it to our lives. Lord, challenge, encourage us by your word this day. We love you. We praise you. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. It's great to be with you. So glad you guys are here. And uh, just want to encourage you through this song, um, I know a lot of us are facing things that we've never faced before, but the call is to have faith in God. Amen. Let's stand as we worship the Lord. Sing it again.
let's just continue to praise him. Just thankful for his love this morning.
Thank you, wife. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. You've heard that saying. You probably said it yourselves as well. In making such a comment, making that statement, we are making a statement about who we believe in, God, but also that we believe His power over our lives and His direction and plan for our lives is the perfect plan, is the perfect direction. When a Christian speaks of good timing, he is recognizing that God is good. He is recognizing that God has a perfect nature and because of that has a perfect plan for each of us who would follow Him. I want us to look at timing issues. Even though I said we don't really live by timing as everything, but I want us to look at some of the timing issues in this story of Moses. First is this. Moses is born at a time when boys were being put to death. Good timing or bad timing? Yeah. Tell her, what do you think? Would that be good timing or bad timing? Bad timing, right? Yeah, he was born and other little boys were being, being put to death. What about this? Mothers, Moses, mothers, Moses. Moses' mother hid him in the home for three months. Good timing, bad timing. It was good timing. She was able to have him there. She was able to protect him, give him a good start in his life. What about this? Moses' mother hid him among the reeds. Now, this little basket that she put him in, it was really much like just a miniature boat, how they made boats of that day. And she made this basket so it would float water and protect her baby. Good timing or bad timing? Well, I would say this is bad timing in the sense that she had to put her baby down into the reeds along the river. What might have happened to him? He might have drowned. And he might say crocodiles were several. Yeah, the crocodiles might have eaten his child. And, and look, I think that's a serious concern. Who did Pharaoh's daughter send to grab the basket in the reeds? She didn't go herself. She sent one of her servants to go over there. He might have been eaten by a crocodile. What about this one? Pharaoh's daughter had taken time to bathe. She found the child. That, was, that ended up being a good time, didn't it? But you could say from this sense, if Pharaoh's daughter had been really determined to carry out the wishes of her father, that could have been bad time as well. He might have died because Pharaoh's daughter found him. Another one. Moses' sister speaks at the appropriate time while Pharaoh's daughter was touched by the helplessness of this baby. At just the right moment, Moses' sister spoke, and, and Pharaoh's daughter was, she had this little baby, and she knew that the baby had been abandoned or left there. The baby was crying, and her heart strings went out. And so that was a good timing moment. The sister spoke at just the right time. Here's another one. Moses' mother was given the job of nursing the baby. Good timing, bad timing. Let's take it a step further. It was great timing, wasn't it? And we'll talk about it in a minute. How perfect is that? That's God in action. When Moses grew older, in the appropriate time, he was taken back, taken back to Pharaoh's daughter. Good timing, bad timing. You can say both. Let's read something. If you can do it quickly, turn with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 7, and we'll read three verses there. And if you're not there, you will hear what I'm saying and you will understand. Verse 20. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, that means pretty much he was being found out because he could not be hid any longer. When he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. And I want you to focus on his last, that last verse and the truth of his taught there. He was taught in the ways of the Egyptians. He was even blessed or given the ability to speak. Was that important or not? Certainly it was, because ultimately Moses will be the deliverer of the Israelites out of Egypt. He needed to be able to take that, have a good standing before the Egyptians to bring God's message to them. Now I want you to see from that, there are times when we are in preparation, we may think it is a bad time, but it is really God at work preparing us for the job that he has to do 
later down the road. Ultimately, God's timing is always perfect. You can say it this way. God is always right on time. Amen. Right on time. Well, what can we learn from our passage today? First is this. God does not work the way we work. He does not think the way that we think. Amen. Consider this. How would you have delivered Israel? How would you have carried out the deliverance of Israel? And from the standpoint or the sense that God begins delivering Israel by, by having a baby born, is that the way you were done? Having a baby born, having this baby to be abandoned, not abandoned, but left where Pharaoh's daughter could find the baby, being brought up in the household of the Pharaoh, being trained in such a way, years and years passed. We know the story of Moses. It wasn't the time he grew from a baby to 30, and that was it. It was even much longer than that for the liver team. Is that the way you would have done it? I'll ask this question. Why wasn't a leader raised up from one of the older men? Why didn't you look at Brother Terry of the day and say, Brother Terry, you're going to lead us out. Brother Rick, you're going to lead us out. Brother Jack, you're going to lead us out. He didn't do that, but we might ask why. Why didn't God do it that way? Do we have an answer? We can shake hands. We really don't know. Why didn't God use an army to come and rescue Israel? Certainly he could have done that. He could have raised up a group very easily that would have come in and, and declared war upon Egypt and then delivered his people. And he didn't do it that way either. Why did the Israelites have to wait for so many years? And I guarantee in that time, in their hardship, in their trials, what are we waiting on, they thought? Why can't we be out of bondage? Why can't this oppression be taken from us? And in their minds that they knew, they were probably thinking, why did it have to be a baby? Why wasn't it someone else? But God was preparing, and in his perfect timing, he was bringing things about. Coincidence? I think not. I think not. There are so many things in your life that you can say, it's not about coincidence. In 1993, I was in the parking lot of a church in Fort Worth. I was their youth minister. And a beautiful young lady drove up into that parking lot. And by coincidence, I was looking really good that day. <laughs> and she looked upon me, and she fell in love with me, and we are married to this day. Coincidence, I, I think not. And you know, it's easy. But God did not bring us together by coincidence. It was the hand of God. At work, and so many times we don't see that. In her book, Tell Me Again, Lord, I forgot, Ruth Calkin writes these words. She says, At first, I, I looked at the Lord and I asked you to take sides with me. And this is her comment with David the psalmist, I circled and underlined. So she talked about taking her Bible out, looking at the psalms, and underlined praise. And this is what she underlined The Lord is for me. Really, she meant the Lord is for me to boss around. She said, maintain my rights, O Lord. She underlined that. Let me stand above my foes. That's a good one, isn't it? Underline it. But with all my pleading, I lay drenched in darkness until in utter confusion I cry. Don't take sides, Lord. Just take over. And that, that's exactly what we need to hear, what we need to be. And she said, suddenly it was morning. Isn't it funny how morning comes when we get into the war? We can struggle all night in darkness, and we will be there for a whole period if we keep trying to do it our way. But when we say, Lord, don't take my sight, just take over, that's when the morning comes. That's when the light comes. But we learn that God doesn't work our way. He doesn't think our way. Secondly, God has a way of meeting our needs and, and blessing us abundantly. This is verse 9. Moses has been found by Pharaoh's daughter. And his sister speaks up. Hey, can I go and find a Hebrew woman to nurse his baby? Well, she knew where she was going. She goes right back to Moses' mother. And gives, gives his baby to her. Isn't it incredible? That is incredible. Not only did the baby go back to his mom, but did you catch the rest of what happened? She said, and I will pay you for it. 
She was doing exactly what she wanted to do, wasn't she? She wanted to be a mom. And she was being paid for it. Isn't God wonderful? Amen. He is wonderful. Amen. Do you ever thank God for allowing you to pursue your call? Amen. Think about it. Do you ever thank God for allowing you to pursue your call? You ought to. Because you've been gifted especially for some calling. I think about even when I was an accountant, that was, that was my, my calling in that time in my life. But why was I called that way? Because I was wired that way. I am still very, you can say, I'm anal, like Gary Rowe in a sense, and I had to have things in order. But that was my makeup. So what better place for me to keep things in order than while I served as an auditor? That is perfect. Thank you, God, for putting me there. What about those who, who teach our children? John, aren't you thankful for, for those who have the calling to teach the children? It's, it's wonderful because their hearts are there. They want to be prepared. They have a message. They have something to teach you guys every time you go in that will prepare you down the road. And I can talk about every one of your positions. We have a lady in our early service. She's open a ba opening a bakery. And, and she says, yeah, I am thankful for that opportunity. I love to bake. I love to eat. And, and look, I get to do it for others. Well, take that question a step further. Do you ever thank God? Not only did he allows you to pursue your calling, but he allows you to be paid for it. He allows you to put bread in on your table, roof over your head, clothing on your body, car to drive. He's providing. Are you thanking God for all that? I want our students to recognize something. You may not have a job right now, but you have callings. And you need to be thankful for that calling. And I look up at the balcony because I see four or five up there this morning. What are you going to do with the calling that God has placed on your life? What are you going to do when you're in school? What are you going to do, young man, when you are at work? What are you doing with God's calling and how it's provided for you? What will you do? What will you do? I want to tell a story. It's a little bit of a joke, but it, it, it's a really hitting type joke. In some regions of Mexico, there are hot springs and cold springs that are side by side. And so the locals are taking advantage of it. They will go and they will, in that hot springs, boiling water, they'll wash your clothes in. They'll take their clothes out and then they will rinse them in the cold water. And there was a tour being given and one of the tours asked the tour guide, I suppose, and he said, Mother Nature, and it makes sense when you hear the rest of the story. He says, I suppose that, that these locals is praise Mother Nature for, for giving them abundant supply of hot and cold water where they can come, wash their clothing, rinse their clothing, have clean clothing. And the tour guide said, no, senor, there is much grumbling because she supplies no soap. <laughs> but isn't that just like us? There is an abundance poured out upon us. It is around us. We see it. And yet there's something missing, we think, and we grumble about what is missing. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, Paul writes, Now to him who is able to measure measurably more than all we ask, all we imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful expression? To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And so it, it makes you begin to think. When times are tough, where do we turn? Certainly to God. Our times, I'm going to ask you a question. Are times desperate? No. Or are they not? Are times desperate or are they not? To him who is able to do abundantly more than all we ask or imagine, are times desperate? No. I'm going to tell you, as bad as things look in this world around us, as bad as they may even look personally, God does not say this is a desperate time. Right. Because he is in control. He is able to provide, as we just read, immeasurably. No measure to it. We can't even grasp what God wants to do. Yeah, our churches are not in difficult times. We're in different times. We're in different times. But God is at work. Amen. Amen. Number three, God's miraculous deliverance of Moses foreshadows another deliverance. 
particularly the deliverance of Israel. We'll go a little further in a second. The deliverance of Moses is nothing short of miraculous. This was miraculous. This little baby surviving. Years ago, a young mother was making her way across the hills of South Wales. She was overtaken by a blinding blizzard. She never reached her destination. And when the blizzard had subsided, her body was found by the searchers who were out looking for her. They discovered that before her death, she had taken out all her outerwear, her heavy, warm clothing. She had wrapped that baby up in that clothing. She did put her body even over that. And as they discovered her, they, they made a great discovery this baby lived. Because his mother gave her life to protect. Isn't that what mothers did? Years later, David Lloyd George, mid-grown to manhood, became prime minister of Great Britain. This is a boy. This is his baby. And without doubt, he was one of England's greatest statements. And I believe, looking on this picture, that Jochebed, the mother of Moses, had that kind of love. She gave her best to protect her child. She went against the commands that were wrong to kill the children, of course. But she could have faced death. She could have faced the wrath of Pharaoh, but she refused to give in to that. She protected her child, miraculously protected him. The deliverance of Moses foreshadows. You know what that means? It, it, it gives an example of what is going to come later. His deliverance foreshadows the deliverance that would ultimately be experienced by the Israelites. They would be delivered miraculously. And I will tell you that there were times when they were in bondage, when they were in oppression, they were in slavery, and they wondered, when will we be delivered? And I can even tell you this, there were times when they stood out of Egypt, after these plagues had, had brought their deliverance, and they're out in the wilderness, and there's a great army pursuing them. And it was the Egyptian army. And they're hot on their heels, and yet before them, the great sea, the Red Sea. Where do we go? Where do we turn? We've got an army behind us. We've got, a, we've got water before us. But what did God do? He delivered, didn't he? Miraculously parting the Red Sea so the Israelites could go right through. The water then came back over the Egyptian army. And what about these same Israelites when they're out? They're crying for food and God provides for them manna. He provides for them quail to eat. And they're still grumbling. At times they even say, Oh, that we were back in Egypt where the onions and the leeks were plentiful. And yet God delivered them. A whole generation had passed because of their ultimate doubt, but God delivered them. The greater, and that's a great picture, isn't it? It's a great picture. What a wonderful thing for us to be able to see in God's Word. But there is still a greater deliverance that is foreshadowed here, and that is our deliverance. If you've asked Jesus for forgiveness of sin, you have experienced a deliverance greater than what we just spoke of. God sent his son, born of a virgin, to walk this earth. He lived without sin. And yet he was persecuted. He was put on the cross. He died on that cross. He was buried in the tomb and raised to life. And it was all so that we would have deliverance. So that our sins might be forgiven. So that we will have not just the hope, the promise of eternity with God in heaven one day through a relationship with Jesus. That's a great deliverance. Woody Allen once said, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> you know, that's funny, but it's also sad. Yes. It, it reminds me of truth. But here, here's the good news. With the great deliverer, we don't have to worry about when it happens, do we? Because we know that leaving this earth, whatever that time is, means being ushered into the presence of the Lord. God delivers miraculously. Number four, God is in charge of kingdoms. 
even when they do not openly submit. Amen. Come on now. God is in charge of your boss, even when he does not openly submit. You know, and I, I mean this in a great sense. I appreciate it so much. I, I am married to a teacher. I appreciate all teachers. But I know sometimes you students may have trouble with a particular teacher. But I want you to know your teacher is in submission. She's in the hands of God. Even when openly she's not submitting, you pray for her. You know, pray for her, whoever that may be. And you do right. You do right. You continue to do what God would have you do. You know, look at Look at our passage today, and I'll even give you some, some back uh, history. Verse 17, chapter 1. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt created. What was happening? So he has commanded death to come to these boys, but the midwives feared God. His effort to do away with these boys was thwarted once again, or once here. Verse 19. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So the Israelite mothers confounded the plans of Pharaoh. The midwives confounded the plans of Pharaoh. In, in verses 3, 4, and in 79, chapter 2, the mother confounded Pharaoh, thwarted his effort. The sister thwarted the efforts of the Pharaoh. And then even his own daughter, Verse 10, when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. All these people being used by God, commanded by God, whether they openly submitted or not, they were at God's control and under his hand. The scripture says this, Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Psalm 47, 7, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Revelation 19, 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, king of kings and lord of lords. What does that mean? It means amen. I mean, this is exciting. It doesn't matter what king you name. It doesn't matter what ruler you name. God is above them all. Amen. King, he is the king over every king. He is the lord of over every Lord. Amen. He is in control. Back when he was a boy, Chuck Swindoll went to church in East Houston. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. I don't even know if you know who Chuck Swindoll is, but a great preacher of our day. And he said he used to go to church as a little boy, and he would see the sign. Someone had put out large black lettering, a little white sign, and it said, let go and let God. He said, I watched that boy every time I went to church as a child. As a teenager, I saw that sign every time we drew up, drove up to church. And he said, for years and years, I saw that sign. He continues. He said, well, not certain. It's rather well documented where that sign came from, the origin of the phrase. Seems to have come from the 19th century from a college student. This college student had taken index cards and written, as large as you can on a card, one of those letters, L. E, T, and G-O-D, just let God. And so he had that on his mantelpiece, and he would see that. He would focus his day, remember, let God. He said one day the windows were open, and a breeze came through, and it blew the D off the end of that phrase. And he went to pick it up, and when he looked, he said, I knew that God was giving me a message. Amen. Because it then said, let go. He said, that is what the Christian life is all about. Let go and let go. God. Does God protect you? Amen. The pastor told the story when he was a boy. He said our house had been broken into three times. Valuable stolen. We had no sense of security. Our dad knew that. And he said, I'm not going to let my family live like this anymore. He was determined to make a difference. So first he put up a big fence and gate around the yard. It was always locked. Had those points on the top. Boy said, if anybody want to get in our house, they're going to get stuck with one of those points. He said, then dad didn't stop there. He put behind that fence a dog. It was a very protective chow chow by the name of Scrappy. So if a would be intruder got over the fence, he still had to deal with Scrappy. He said, dad still wasn't finished. 
He put bars on the windows. He put deadbolts onto the doors. And so we were in a position that even if somebody wanted to get to us, they had to go over the fence, through the dog, through the bars or the deadbolts. And he said, finally, my dad had some guns. <laughs> he had plenty of ammunition. We got through all the other stuff. Dad was going to fill this man with his ammunition. He was going to protect us. You know, that Bible was serious about protecting his children. But our God is too. He, he, he is serious. Those children in the story, they didn't have to do anything to earn the protection of the Father. We do not have to do anything to earn the protection of God. He cares about us. It is automatically given to us because of his character, because of his love. Thank the Lord that our God is protective of us as children. I finish today. This reminds me, God's time is perfect. He's always at work. Even when we fail to see that. And there are times, I don't care how strong you are in your relationship with the Lord, there are times when all of a sudden you're thinking, where's God? He's there. He's at work. And he will deliver. Amen. Have you surrendered, submitted to his command? Do it today. Let's see and pray. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study it today. We thank you, Lord, of your nature. We thank you that even when we fail, when we struggle, when we wander, that you are protective of us, that you are inviting of us to come back to you, that we are welcome back into your plan for our, for our lives. Lord, I pray today that these words will bring encouragement. I look out over this congregation and I pray that you have spoken to each one here. May we now rest in that truth in one sense, but also apply it in another sense. Take it out and live it. Live like we know that we've been delivered. Live like we know that there's a Savior who loves others and they don't know him yet. And we go out and tell of that love, of that deliverance. Lord, I pray as we come now to this time of invitation and commitment, if you've led anyone here that needs to make a decision, you would give them courage to step out from where they're standing, to share a decision or ask questions. If you do not know Jesus personally, will you not accept his offer of salvation today? Right where you're standing, you can pray, Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for the forgiveness of my sin. I need the Savior. I need you. Will you come into my life, Lord? Shape my life that I may live for you. If you prayed that prayer, he came into your heart, surely. He is in your life. But he calls you not to be secretive about it, but to share it with others. Won't you step out from where you're standing? Even now, come forward and take Brother Sam's hand and share the decision that God has laid upon your heart. Lord, if you led others here to need a prayer of encouragement, if you have others who are facing difficulties, and they just want a brother to pray with them, give them upon their heart the encouragement to step out. Lord, I pray that your spirit will move in our time of invitation and commitment. In Jesus' name, that we respond. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Bible study, this devotion time, and to pray through the needs of our community, our church family. And, and if you would like to be a part of getting that list, I know Brother Sam mentioned, let us know. You can contact us through the information you've seen in your bulletin, giving us your email address so that we can send you all the updates and all the latest news through that, that contact information. I'm going to ask Brother Terry if you would close us in prayer together today. You guys go out to have a great week after prayer. You are dismissed. I'm going to hang around up here if anyone would like to visit. One last thing before you pray. I am planning to go to one of our local schools, and I don't know if anybody is willing to do that and would like a partner to go. Uh, so let me know. I'll be hanging out up here after the service if you would like to be a part of that. Brother Terry. Father God in heaven, we thank you for what our ears have heard and what we sensed of your moving in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace, and may it be extended abundantly to us in this time of difficulty and trial as we go in your strength. We praise you and give all honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.